Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're, and welcome to today's webinar. Security is a journey and not a destination. Uh, Matt, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that they are on mute and their video is off. But if you would like to ask a question, please uh, feel free to use the chat feature and our for our panelists, and we, they will get your questions answered. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be sent out as well as listed on our YouTube channel. I'd like to get uh, go to the next slide. I'd like to uh, I'd to get started. I would like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Matt Briggs, our director of new business development. Uh, Sean Trojak, our security practice lead, and Corey Smith, our SOC team lead. I will now hand it over to you guys. Go ahead and get started. It, yeah, um, Corey, I love your profile picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's identical. Uh, it's identical. <clears throat> right. So, um, good, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, uh, depending on where you are. Um, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for uh, a cybersecurity discussion, another cybersecurity discussion, because it is uh, top of mind for most people. So, uh, my name is Matt Briggs. I'm the director of new business development and channel sales. Uh, I've been with Diopath for 18 years. For those of you that that don't know me, uh, and then uh, Sean and Corey were introduced by by Charlie, and they're going to be you know assisting as we run through the webinar. So um, today's theme is security is a journey and not a destination. And um, it, it's really become our, our mantra over the years. And um, in my opinion, the, the most important takeaway from this session is the fact, if you're going to take one thing away, is the fact that all organizations should strive to continuously improve their security posture. The, the work is never done if you are going to keep pace with ever evolving threats of threat actors that are out there. And, you know, we're going to chat about some of these uh, modern day threats and, and, you know, some of them are downright uh, scary. So, uh, as, as far as the agenda is concerned, uh, we'll probably run for an hour, maybe a little bit less. Um, certainly want to give ample time for Corey to <clears throat> provide a demonstration. I think there's going to be a lot of value there, but before we do that, um, we will go into just a very quick uh, snippet overview of who Diopath is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the objectives, um, certainly have a discussion around um, cyber security going mainstream, um, talk about culture and uh, programmatic elements of uh, uh, security. Um, we want to impress upon you guys the importance of um, understanding the value of the assets in which you're protecting. Um, when you look at making investments in cyber, um, you know, we want a, a security program to be flexible and adaptable. And then, like I said, we'll, we'll roll into the demo. And, um, you know, please, um, you know, anytime you guys have questions, pop those into the chat box. And uh, Charlie, Bill, if you can give us a heads up on any questions that are coming in, we'd appreciate it. But um, don't, don't be shy. We want to uh, have this be interactive. Um, so, in, in regard to uh, Diopath, um, so 25 years in the IT outsourcing market, so we've been uh, in this space for uh, a significant amount of time. Co-headquartered in Houston and Chicago, we have uh, other offices scattered um, throughout the U.S. Um, you know, we we have very you know diverse revenue streams and diverse clients that we work with. 50% uh, of our annual revenues derived uh, from the commercial market segment. Uh, I'd say primarily mid-market and enterprise. 25% uh, comes from um, federal and public sector and 25% comes from education. We've had the education vertical practice for about 12 years now. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly we're, we're ITIL aligned, and, and I think for those of you that have been on webinars in the past, ITIL is just a framework that uh, allows us as a service provider to uh, align um, the IT operations and IT security operations with uh, the business or the organization goals and objectives. So we've got, you know, methodology and a framework in place to do that very metric driven and one of the largest privately held MSPs 
um, in the U.S. And I bring that up because our focus on is on you guys as as clients, partners, and employees versus uh, you know having to worry about uh, investment horizons, for example, of a, a private equity or, or, or VC. Um, and then in regard to uh, just advanced security, we've been delivering those solutions for 18 years now. Um, Corey's going to give you a, a look under the hood uh, as it relates to our SOC or Security Operations Center. That's 24 by 7 by 365. We've got around 30 security practitioners involved in that. And then, you know, we're, we're often asked what what makes us you know unique in in um, cybersecurity. You know, there are a lot of organizations that are focused on that at the moment. And you know, not only is it our experience, you know, being involved uh, for 18 years, but you know, also things like we've hosted uh, F the FBI's uh, DNA.gov um, site for a number of years. They were building out their their own data center uh, and, and assets, and you know, we've hosted electronic health records of the uh, every single employee in the ICE division of Homeland Security. Um, you know, we're doing some interesting programs. With with uh, HHS's BARDA division, as it relates to combating um, uh, you know pandemics like like, uh, like COVID, so very um, sensitive programs that require uh, a, a, an approach that is 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 locked up from a security program perspective. Um, and then for those of you who don't know, you know we we authored uh, the NERC SIP framework uh, that is leveraged in the energy sector. And you know, w without getting into too much detail, this is a framework that's used so that organizations like utility companies um, can continue to harden their um, uh, IT security environment so that they're compliant uh, with with uh, you know the U.S. government. Uh, we follow NIST cybersecurity framework as a, a guiding light, and we are secret top secret cleared with the U.S. government to satisfy some of our uh, government contracts and, and private sector clients and education clients leverage off of what we've done. You know, we've been audited, assessed, we have policies and procedures in place um, to to you know gain that uh, that top secret clearance. And then um, you know, lastly, and we'll, we'll move on from Diopath. You know, robust, uh, comprehensive security practice. Uh, but it's also worth noting that we have six other core practice areas: cloud connectivity, uh, managed services, uh, ITO, IT outsourcing, ProServe, and then, uh, you know, education. And so, you, you know, the, the end result is if there is a fit for us to work with you on all these fronts, uh, we're able to do that and I think be more effective in not only supporting you tactically, but strategically, you know, going back to ITIL and aligning um, technology Really, to serve the, uh, the the business as best it can, um, trusted, client centric, authoritative, um, and, and I think one of our primary advantages is we strike a healthy balance between um, being high touch and then also having some advantages of scale that we can bring the bears as we work with you as well. <clears throat> so, um, you know, as as far as um, Objectives and questions as, as we run through, you know, the, you know, the, the webinar today, you know, I'd say a common mistake. Um, you probably heard a state in the past is, um, you know, being overly fixated on on tools. Right? So, the instrumentation, the tool sets associated with cybersecurity, um, you know, and I think in the past foundational tools, um, things like. Firewalls, uh, antivirus, uh, email security, content filtering. Those, you know, from a preventative perspective, you know, they were they were good enough to thwart the majority of, of attacks. And so again, there's always this this uh, this fixation on on tools. And then, um, you know, I would say these tools and instrumentation receive a lot of marketing um, attention, uh, and you know, so that's why they're at the forefront. Um, however, you know, foundational and even advanced tools are only one functional area of a security program. And, uh, you know, candidly, these tools can be bypassed um, by threat actors that know what they're doing and are, are sophisticated. 
So, you know, we're going to chat about this in more detail. I know Corey's going to hit on it, but um, tools are important, but people, uh, you know, there, there's, there's this trilogy here, people, uh, you know, so practice leads, uh, virtual CISO, um, security analysts, SOC uh, engineers, program managers, technical account managers, um, you know, the, the, the human capital component is really uh, critical as you look at an overarching security program. And then, you know, the, the, the process on top of that. So NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, MITRE attack framework. I mean, there's others that help dictate, you know, workflow and, and how we uh, go about our, our business as, as we support you guys in your security initiatives. And then um, security is top of mind, right? So um, it, it, it's gone mainstream. Uh, there is a elevated level of consciousness in general, um, given all the headlines that uh, breaches and anomalies get. And you know, I would say more action is being taken um, by organizations to enhance their cybersecurity posture. But uh, you know, more. Uh, more can be done, you know, I, I'd say specifically to engage, uh, you know, the executive teams. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But I mean, you, you look at some of these headlines. So the solar wind pack in December got a lot of press, right? There was a, a group out of Russia. I, I think everyone's somewhat familiar with it. Um, it was scary because of how surgical and how sophisticated the attack was. And then, you know, you, you look at, Entities like the Department of Energy, right, <laughs> that, 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 that were, were caught up in this. And, you know, SolarWinds, uh, you know, had a very high level of trust. And, and that's why, you know, this that, caught folks uh, off guard. And then, you know, fast forward to March of this year, the exchange vulnerability exploit, um, you know, re wreaked havoc. And, and a lot of organizations were breached. And, um, you know, Sean might be able to, if, if he's on, um, you know, talk about, some of our incident response engagements there. But, um, you know, the, the FBI had to get court orders to engage to uh, remediate, especially those organizations that had, um, I would say, more more sensitive data. So, Sean, are you, uh, you on? Do you want to comment on the? Uh, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, certainly. And and sorry about that. I had some some significant technical technical difficulties getting on this call. I think the the universe was conspiring against me, but we we eventually made it. <laughs> and that's a that's a whole other point in security we could talk about. But yeah, uh, I, I think um, for from my point of view, I, I I think that the the exchange and the the solar winds and and there's been others, but I think as a community. Um, we, we and I say we the security community have been kind of saying these things for years that these are the types of things that we need to to take care of and um, and it, you know it a lot lots of times and I don't mean disrespect but you know that message would kind of fall on deaf ears and so forth but you know eventually um, uh, most recently th th these things I think are hitting uh, people uh, left and right that they're starting to get it like wow this is this is intense and so when we start getting into incident response the one takeaway I had was look lots of these organizations that we've got into they already had tools in place I mean they they thought that they were covered uh, but when we got into it, it's like oh guess not because uh the tools just, you know, just simply didn't take care of the things that they thought were taken care of. You know, some of it was just policy and configuration and stuff like that. But ultimately, you just didn't want to have um, just have the tools and think that you sign that check and you're good. There's there's much more to it. So yeah, that's that's my main takeaway, Matt. It, yeah. So I mean, the the the, the exchange you know, vulnerability kept kept us, uh, I'd say, very busy. You know, in March and and you know early in April, and and that's starting to taper off as. We help uh, you know organizations get back on on the straight and narrow and and you know Corey maybe when we're doing the demo you can talk a little bit about um, extended detection and response or SOC as a service and how that helped uh, you know thwart uh, this particular type of campaign so it might be good to tie that in if you don't mind. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, and, and then um, you know a, a recent one, the Pulse uh, Pulse Secure VPN, um, you know vulnerability that was announced uh, earlier in the month, and uh, you know some some uh, Chinese groups being you know behind that, and, and then you know long story short, 
when when the Shark Tank guy is is calling out cybersecurity and LinkedIn, you know, you, you know the the topic is is certainly reached uh, you know fever pitch and is uh, is uh, you know prime time uh, fodder. So um, let, let's let's talk a little bit about security culture. Um, you know, I, I'd say it's um, it's often overlooked in general, and um, you know in a lot of instances by uh, the executive leadership team for years, you know, cybersecurity was looked at as, you know, what uh, IT uh, needs to address that and handle that. And we've harped on the fact that cyber risk is is, is business risk, right, or or organizational risk in general. Um, and and so, um, if there is a strong culture that has been developed from the top down, I think what happens is investments are made. Uh, continuous improvement initiatives occur. And I'd say most importantly, from my standpoint, the weakest link in this uh, attack chain, uh, which is employees, it does, um, you know, because of the social engineering aspects, um, you know, employees become more uh, effective at, at stamping out um, threats. And so uh, just quickly, you know, if, if you don't understand, you know, the, the security culture concept, I mean, really, it's uh, it's attitudes, it's beliefs, it's values, it's knowledge of uh, individuals and groups that, um, you know, demonstrate uh, a commitment to and proficiency of uh, an organization security program, right? It's, it's uh, you know, really as, as simple as that. And, you know, we talked about, you know, getting, uh, you know, buy-in from, from the top so that it will permeate uh, throughout the entire organization. And then um, how, how do we promote it? And I'd love for Sean to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, security awareness training in a minute. But um, we want training to occur when somebody new is onboarded, right? And then there, there needs to be an ongoing training component, you know, whether that's quarterly or biannual. Um, where where we're, we're we're going over um, what's important, what are common ruses, what's new, um, and, and then um, simulating social engineering campaigns so that uh, you know, folks understand that if this were to occur to them, here's the process in reporting it. You know, here's how you get uh, the wheels in motion there. But um, you know, you, you hear a lot about zero trust, and I, I would say that's not feasible with with security awareness training. I mean, if nobody trusts anything they're receiving, then things are gonna come to gridlock. But if we can get to a point where we we trust but verify, then I, I think we're, we're on a winning path. Um, Sean, uh, lo love to get your, your feedback here. Yeah, uh, great stuff there, Matt. Uh, so one of the points I want to bring up here is, uh, imagine that you're you're a new employee uh, you're coming on and you've got certain performance characteristics and, and things that are assigned to you as an employee. Like you've, you've got a performance review coming up and so forth. And if, if uh, that security training is not part of, of those requirements, if it's just kind of something that's set in, 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 in passing and you're not really getting measured by, then why should you care? And so when we say something about, you know, tone at the top and promotion and so forth, I think in order for employees to take it seriously, they need you know compelling reasons to do that. So that's a big part of it. Uh, and furthermore, if we start talking about security training, I mean, I think anyone can go out. They can go to Google. They can they can probably spend a hundred dollars and and get a, a training program that'll get the job done. You can you can check the box and and call it a day. But I would say that it is more than just uh, lecturing at employees. Uh, here's you know here's a list of things that you're going to forget in you know a day. Uh, what you're trying to do is make it a part of their consciousness, where it's where it's a part of of their behavior. Um, and and to do that, I think what you're trying to do is give them an experience that they won't forget. Um, if it comes across as a lecture, I guarantee you, gone the next day. So just just be careful with that type of stuff. Those are probably my two main points, Matt. Yeah, and, and I've noticed, you know, your approach, you know, the, the team's approach to awareness training is to um, is, is to connect with the audience and, and even tell um, stories you guys see in the, the, the trenches, right? Stuff that that's happening. And, and wow. I, I think if if you explain, you know, why we're doing this, you know, you, you give the reasoning versus, hey, it's time to take another fifteen minute 
um, you know, quarterly training session. You know, we don't want folks to check the boxes. We want them to understand uh, why we're doing it, right? So I, I, yeah. I know you guys do a good job of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and we get a lot of questions about, especially, you know, work from home, right, with, with, with COVID, um, you know, the, uh, the perimeter of your IT environment has extended, expanded, and, and it presents these, these challenges. And, and I'm sure you guys have heard a lot of this before, um, but I want to I, I tie this back into this is why the security uh, culture is even more important now than uh, in the past where a lot of individuals were sitting within the confines of a, an office, um, a, you know, a school, um, an agency, and, and, and so, um, for example, right, I mean, you know, social engineering, phishing, spear phishing in particular uh, has gotten really good. Um, and, and so if you're alone in your home office and you don't have anyone to walk, you know, you walk down to the next cube or office, tap on their shoulder and say, hey, does this look like, right, or you sent me this, then, um, you know, they're more susceptible to this campaign being uh, effective, right? And then you know, we talked a lot about data sprawl, right? So you might have your uh, corporate issued workstation at home, you're having a hard time printing something from your home office um, printer. So you just push your data, do a personal device and then print and all of a sudden sensitive data may be in a spot where it isn't uh, protected like it needs to be. And then, you know, we, we know that most, you know, home office networks or that network in, in, in Starbucks that you're working out of <clears throat> may, may not be uh, as well protected, right, as, <clears throat> you know, again, the confines of the office. So <clears throat> there, there's all these pitfalls that come with it, but if, you know, you trust and verify, and if we put tools in place, um, you know, that, that follow that zero trust principle uh, will be in, in much better shape. So Sean, Corey, anything else to add there? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you've probably already said a lot of the points, but basically, I, I think the the most important one you said was was the idea of kind of being an island when when you're out there working from home. Um, you know, there's a, there's a tendency, and you you can't um, rely on the institutional knowledge as much. And so, I think a big part of it is the these users who are out there. They have to have channels to to you know bounce ideas off of and connect with, so they can understand you know whether or not something's real or not. Um, you know, we, whenever we go into an organization, we do training. That's one of the first things we try to set up is to make sure that those communication channels are open. And to me, just a ball metaphor, that's just kind of blocking and tackling right there. It's making sure that they can they can report things where they need to be. And I, I and I mean more than just you know having the little logo that says um, you know Mimecast or whatever tool you may be using, uh, but rather a, a method to communicate across the organization so that you can detect campaigns and squash them before they get any further. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. All right. So I, I thought this was kind of in, interesting. I'm, I'm not surprised by it, but I think everyone understands the difference between spear phishing and phishing. If you don't, phishing is is more of a scatter shot approach. I'm gonna you know hit uh, tens and tens of people, hundreds and uh, you know thousands of people with um, a a ruse, a message. Um, normally, you know, masquerading as somebody uh, that, that they aren't, right? Position of power, um, you know, after doing a little bit of uh, homework, right? So that's why we call it social engineering. How do we tap into, um, uh, you know, that 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 human side, right? And and so spear phishing is targeted. Um, and, and what I find interesting, so the source is iron scale earlier this year, so 77% of attacks targeted 10 mailboxes or less, and then a third of those attacks was a single user, a, a single mailbox. And what's, um, what's interesting about this is if you're being more targeted as a threat actor with your social engineering campaign, uh, you can customize that content and make it look more believable, more, more real, and therefore the uh, the effectiveness of the campaign is going to be much, much better. And so um, yeah, I'm sure most of you have received 
you know, phishing email, spear phishing email. I, I received one uh, about three weeks ago that was really, really good. It was uh, it was a client of ours, and we kind of had <clears throat> a, a little joke around it. If you want to get a, a, a salesperson to click on something, put in the header, uh, you know, purchase order right from 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 a client, and 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 so. But all all kidding aside, um, you know, some some of these campaigns are really really good uh, right now, and so you, you trust but but verify, pick up the phone, um, understand the process for reporting. A, a, a potential uh, uh, phishing or spear phishing email and, and go from there. So, Sean, anything uh, from your perspective on that point? Yeah, I think just, you know, I've got, a, I could talk all day about it, but maybe one takeaway. Um, <clears throat> these guys, they learn your, your behaviors. They, they learn how you speak as an organization. When, when we looked at this years ago, it used to be that, uh, these lots of times they could barely speak English, so on and so forth. They've learned how to speak accounting. They've learned how to adjust to the culture of your organization and so forth. So just, you know, be on guard. Um, it, it can come from anywhere. So that's that's usually where I see people get hit. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, just looking at some examples, what I'm showing now is on uh, one side of the screen. You know, the the Liberty Law email. I mean, this was a pretty common. Um, you know, phishing email, maybe some of you guys uh, receive something like it. I mean, it's not quite as laughable. You know, we, again, we joke around about the Nigerian prince having $5 million for you. But, you know, this one is, I would say, as laughable. It, it, it did work. I mean, that's the thing, right? If you go back 10 years, you know, eight years, this is something, you, you know, where people were offering up uh, sensitive contact information. Um, but, you know, nowadays we're, we're a lot more, savvy to, you know, this type of ruse. And then on the other side, you have something that um, I think is is uh, really, really effective, right? It's addressed to an individual. Um, you know, it's it's coming from, you know, what appears to be, you know, the, the IT, the internal IT team, right? Or it could be a, a third-party vendor you guys work with. Um, and, and, and to Sean's point, I mean, the sentence structure is good. You know, it's, it, it's very plausible that somebody could be sending you an email like this and, and ask you to, you know, click on something. And so, um, just, again, want to raise the, uh, the, the overall consciousness of um, the, the, the user base as, as you guys continue to progress your uh, security posture and program. Definitely. And then, um, you know, it, 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 sorry, Sean, did you have something? Oh, all kinds of things. We can proceed, though. Okay. Go ahead, Mike. Um, and then, um, I, you know, Sean, I'd like to flip this over to you um, as our IT security practice lead. You know, what, can you just, at a high level, layman's term, what, what is a security program? Security program is essentially. <clears throat> it's a, it's like a, a roadmap of, of, of security things that you ought to be doing. OK, that you just and I always want to use a car analogy. I'll try to stay away from it this time, but just uh, things that you need to be doing. So you have a roadmap. Uh, you're, you're going to have a set of controls that are that are part of that roadmap. You're going to have policies. You're going to have tools. You're going to assign uh, resources. So who's doing what? Um, and then you're going to have periodic check ins. So you're going to say, you know what? We've we visited this control, you know, a year ago. Let's let's see how it's going. Uh, is, it, is it still working? And then, uh, you know, one more uh, part of it I, I love to to dwell on could talk about for hours is just having a solid uh, risk assessment uh, part of that. But really what that translates into is risk acceptance, meaning a, a, a tool to communicate to the business side the level of risk that they are implicitly accepting and then getting that down on the paper so they, they know what they're signing up for. So to me, that's probably the biggest part of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you've got some more bullets here. Do you want me to continue, or what do you want to do here? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll hit on a few of them, and then, and then I'll I'll come back to you. But it, you, th thanks for that. It, it is, you know, a per, it, it's it's a, a documented set of security policies, procedures, guidelines, standards, and and to Sean's point, it's a it's a roadmap uh, of of practices and, and controls, and it is important to get it down, right, in a document and share that with the organization so that uh, there's very clear expectations on 
on what the program looks like. And uh, I'm sure you guys can imagine, you know, we meet with a lot of organizations. We, we ask about system security programs or plans. And, you know, a lot of the times uh, there, there isn't anything documented, right? It's, it, it's up here with, you know, maybe the CIO, the, the IT operational folks. Um, but it's really important to get it down because once you have that plan in place, you're setting expectations. And, you know, candidly, if there isn't one, then the, the, the security posture, uh, the approach becomes fractured, disjointed, and ultimately it becomes, well, not ineffective, but not as effective as it could be. So, yeah. um, so Sean, if you feel free to, you know, elaborate yeah. some more. Yeah, and, and I think that's where we, it ties into one of the earlier points you had made, which is uh, lots of times we'll see an organization that is, that's got tools, but we'll go in and it's just, to me, I look at it, it's all over the map. You know, some of them are gathering dust. Uh, maybe the policies are gathering dust. Uh, and what that's suggestive of is there's, there hasn't been inclusion or, or a, a alignment with the business to help drive uh, what we're doing here. Um, it's, it's almost as though, well, this thing happened, uh, let's react and let's go buy this tool because it might take care of that. We're not really sure if it's the, the best tool or not and so on. And so uh, you really want to uh, make sure that the, the decisions that you're making are part of an overall cohesive plan. And that's where the security program comes in. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, getting a CISO or or not, what we're finding is a lot of organizations can't necessarily afford that. I mean, the 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 talent is is uh, you know there's there's a great shortage of security jobs out there right now, and and finding good people it's difficult. I mean, I, I can de definitely speak from experience there. It's 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 difficult for me to find good people sometimes, and so uh, on that front, it can be helpful to engage um, you know a third party potentially. Uh, and and uh, just kind of do a do a, a loaning uh, type relationship where they can kind of come in and help and shore up the gaps on, on more of a a, a temporary or a, you know a borrowed type basis if you will. And then, yeah. Yeah, oh, go ahead. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, and then I you know one of the things I hear from from you uh, in the field over and over again is, um, well, where do we start with a security program? I mean, especially if an organization doesn't have compliance and regulation hanging over their head, um, it's it's pick a framework, right? Yeah. And and uh, it, it it doesn't have to be uh, a, um, a a beast like you know NIST eight hundred one seventy one. It can be something more you know practical, pragmatic, um, like uh, uh, Center for Internet Security, the the, the top twenty framework. So, and, and for those of you that don't know what a framework looks like, uh, and, and, you know, here, here's an example of one. So, Sean, maybe you want to break this one down. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> and, and just for a little bit more background on this one, uh, you, re you referenced NIST and some of the other ones. The CIS Top 20 is more oriented towards commercial enterprises because ultimately you guys, uh, you're out there and you, you want to hang your hat on something, right? To say that, you know, we're, we're doing the right things and uh, keep your insurance companies. And, and nowadays your uh, other companies are starting to ask questions and say, what are you doing security wise? You know, people, people that you're doing business with, they want to know. So CIS top 20 is meant for commercial uh, enterprises for the most part. And it's, it's a very practical set of controls. It doesn't cover everything. Uh, it's not as in depth as, as uh, lots of others are but it gets you there very quickly. And furthermore, uh, as you can see here, you've got the basic CIS controls. And so that's almost like um, if, if you wanna get your security program started, you would start with these 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 six here first. Um, and, and don't take this as, as literal. Sometimes, you know, you may have to sh uh, change out one control or another, but basically you lay down these foundational elements. And if you find that you're able to do those well, then you can start to expand your, your range of protection. And so, uh, there is uh, controls and then there is tools. And so when we, when we say controls, really what we're talking about is that it is subject to uh, like an overall kind of monitoring and, and compliance type type uh, process, if you will. So let's, let's pick on one real quick. And I know I'm dwelling a little bit there, Matt. Uh, inventory and control of hardware assets. So you look at that, you say, no problem. Uh, we have, um, hardware in Excel, when we look at about every eight or nine months. Uh, 
okay, you know, that's, that's good. I hear you. Uh, but really what we're looking at is you want to have control over your hardware in the event that someone waltzes into your, your office, plugs in one of these little Wi-Fi pineapples that they can get for a hundred bucks and then takes control of your network. And you don't even know what's going on. So really that's what we're talking about. So there's, there's degrees and, and, and levels in, in each of these. But ultimately, if you don't even know what's on your network, you can't start from anywhere. And that's, that's where the basic controls come in. Matt? Yeah, th th thanks, Sean. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, and then, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we see a lot of um, cart before the horse type in investments. And, and I, I'd like, you know, for you to chime on and in on this one in a minute, but um, you know, I, I think um, from, from my standpoint, investments that you know are made because you know a uh, good marketing campaign, a you know, sales presentation. You know, th th there's a lot of uh, you know, sizzle right out, out there with security tools. But what, what ultimately we want you to do is zoom out, take a step back, and you know, Sean mentioned it earlier. Um, make sure that you're performing a risk analysis before making any decisions on on tools or, or, or even the, the, the program in general, right? You know, so w what's at risk? Is it sensitive data? Is it applications that need to, you know, be up and, and operational nearly 100% of the time to, to, to make the organization go? Um, so, so really start to figure out, um, you know, the data and the things that make the, the organization go and, and how vulnerable they are, and then uh, how likely they are to be compromised. And then lastly, what what is the impact um, if if there is an anomaly, an incident? Um, is you know certainly financial loss um, if if the the organization isn't operating. Um, you know you could get ransomed, um, and and you've got to be careful because um, there's this false sense of security with I've got a cybersecurity insurance rider, but You've got to read the fine print on how much uh, out of pocket you're going to be before that that kicks in. Um, you know, maybe it's legal action, right? Class action lawsuit. Um, it could be compliance penalties. And then, you know, lastly, it's hard to put a dollar figure on this, but reputational damage. We keep going back to, you know, the target breach. And I know a lot of people were very leery about walking into Target and using a credit card after. Um, you know, that, that breach occurred, I, I think it was in 2016 or, or, or 2015. So, um, Sean, any, anything else to add here? Yeah, just what I've noticed is a lot of this seems to, um, I mean, I, I could talk all day again, but I'm going to make a couple of points. Um, I, I've looked at just different banks um, and, and how they, they, they deal with, with these types of things. And some banks, they, they, they try to handle it responsibly. Um, and you could say some organizations for that matter. And so they'll say, well, this is what happened. And, you know, we think that someone got into this and this is their ultimately their important data that they're concerned about their customer data. Right. And you can kind of see just in their attitude that they took it seriously. And so you watch the watch what happens to stock price. Stock price goes nowhere. Uh, volume may go through the roof. Then you see other organizations. You can kind of tell they're they're holding back. Um, whenever they make their, their press releases and whatnot. And I think the public somehow senses that and then the stock price will tank. So it's just an interesting phenomenon I've seen. But ultimately, what you're getting into this, I call it just trying to deal with the so what factor. So as an organization, there, there's going to be things that if, if, if certain information got out or if your, your customer's data gets compromised, I mean, that's the end for you as an organization. No one will trust you again. But others, if they say, well, we were trying, we made a mistake here, we're rectifying that mistake, and then, you know, you've got some some uh, additional room to kind of keep running. So those are the types of things you're trying to understand. And it's different for every organization. Right. And and that's part of a security program, even your, your, your messaging plan when there is an incident response or, or there is an incident and Absolutely. how do you respond to it. And, and, and so I, I think that's spot on. And then... We talked about valuing the assets you're trying to protect. Um, you know, it's good, S similar to with your backups, right? Uh, you know, <clears throat> how, how much downtime can you tolerate in, in the event of uh, um, a breach? And I'll, I'll just give you a few quick examples, right? Things that, you know, we've seen recently. 
Um, you know, we were asked to engage with a, about a billion dollar a year food manufacturer. And, and when you take a step back and understand what they're trying to accomplish, they have ingredients, <clears throat> they have spices that are intellectual property that are the primary revenue engine for the company. And so they wanna make sure that that intellectual property is, is protected. Um, a smaller plastics company asked for our assistance a few weeks ago because they've had some, some recent challenges and it's taken down their ERP platform, it's taken down email, and, and you know, essentially every time those two applications are down, it costs the organization $150,000 a day, right? So it's easy to take a step back and say, okay, well, if this happens, th this is a level of investment I really need to make in cyber to ensure these things don't happen. Or, you know, a nuts and bolts maker in the defense industry base that has controlled uh, um, unclassified uh, information or data that needs to be protected for them to bid on projects, you know, in, in, in you know, the Department of Defense supply chain. So um, just a few, you know, real world examples of, you know, understand that the value of the asset and, and you know, how much downtime you can tolerate so you can go back and, and I'd say justify budget and spend. And then um, I wanna save some time for the demo. So uh, I know we've got about 18 minutes here. So we'll, we'll uh, speed up a little bit, but you know, the, the, there, there's an importance of, of being flexible with your security program and, and uh, adaptive, adaptable, because threats continue to evolve. Um, don't make uh, you know, investments that, that box the organization in. You know, we, we had a, a client that made a major investment in Splunk as a security information event management tool. Um, <clears throat> you know, spent a lot of money spinning it up, uh, tuning it, administering it, and then, you know, unfortunately, they lost a resource that was the subject matter expert internal to the company. And so they're sitting there saying, okay, well, well now what? And, and, and they were, were stuck, and eventually that became a sunk cost. And, they had to go in a different direction, but you know, make sure that whatever you're doing is is flexible and uh, adaptive. And then um, I know, you know, this is this is you know the tagline of of the the webinar, but it, it security is a journey. Um, so it's assessing, it's uh, you know, ongoing security awareness training, it's tuning the the, the program and the policies, it's employing. Um, detection response and and threat hunting capabilities nowadays um, and, and then it's it's uh, you know having an answer uh, when there is a, an incident so th these things all feed each other and and need to continue to be worked on and so you know, we talked a little bit about the Trinity tools process and people uh, um, you know on the people side you need folks that are interpreting data Right, there could be inconclusive events, and Corey, if, if we can hit on this in the demo, I think that would be good too. So something that may be suspicious, we're not sure, have somebody dig in, right, and look at it. Is, is it a uh, um, potentially unwanted program, right, that, 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 that launched? Um, you know, so, so that, that's where the importance comes in, is that interpretation, writing reports, helping with a remediation plan, and ultimately um, incident response. And then, um, you know, we're going to dive into the demo. So, Charlie or Bill, if you can, uh, um, you know, give uh, Corey uh, presentation rights, I would appreciate it. And, and you know, as we um, dig into this, um, you know, there's, there's been a pivot recently. Um, so, Corey, go ahead and feel free to share your screen and I'll keep, uh, <clears throat> keep chatting here. Um, there, there's been this pivot to um, detection and response because we know that sophisticated threat actors are going to bypass tools. They're going to get in there. Um, typically, they're going to want to dwell for um, an extended period of time so that they can figure out uh, sensitive data, where it is, um, how to exfiltrate it, um, you know, uh, how to you know blow away your your, your backups. And so um, we have a. Uh, Extended detection and response service a platform that uh, you know Corey is going to dig into you know right now. So uh, Corey, take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Matt. So 
big thing I want to hit on here is, you know, obviously people process technology is extremely important. Taking that a step further is integrating all three, right? Having really solid comprehensive technology, having the process is built into that technology and being followed and then obviously having the right individuals who are trained on that technology, trained on those processes and going at it, you know, in a, a very integrated manner. And that's exactly how we approach cybersecurity and extended detection response. And if you haven't heard XDR, extended detection response, it's, it's really the idea of being able to see threats and respond to threats, both at the endpoint, in the cloud, at the network layer, kind of the entire uh, composition of your infrastructure. And so as we go through this, I'll, I'll show, obviously the technology, but I'm going to really focus on how our people use the technology and the processes that they follow. So where I'm at right now is how our team manages alerts as they start to filter into the platform. We've taken a little bit of a different approach, kind of, you know, efficiency is king here. And so instead of building off of a list of alerts that can get pretty overwhelming, we utilize a queue. And this allows our team not just to be able to see what's active right now, allowing me to pick this up and add it into my queue, but also understand what the rest of the team is working on. This allows for collaboration uh, between the SOC team. Historically, we've been, you operate in an, a silo, an individual silo, especially in a remote workforce, you know, trying to figure out who's working on what, where I can best utilize my time and that causes delays. And so in our SOC, we utilize this queue to, you know, collaborate together. I understand that I can reach out to Jacob in this case. He's working on this particular alert. Maybe I have some insight, maybe I have some questions. I can interact directly through this platform with, with Jacob. The other thing I like to call out, and this is a key part of extended detection response, is we're not just looking at your security events, obviously our main focus, um, but we're also looking at your system performance, your system and network availability and change management as well. All four of those tell a really important story. And if we're able to correlate those together, that just gives us a more accurate alerts. Uh, and it, we follow the breadcrumbs a little bit more uh, rather than trying to throw a dart sometimes when we see a security alert, but we can't really see, hey, is that affecting anything else in the environment? All we can do is really alert and say, hey, what else is going on? Uh, in this platform, we're able to see all of that in a kind of integrated fashion. Jumping into an alert, I'll focus a little bit more on the process, right? And so we, not just that we have processes, but it's actually built into the, the platform that our team is using. So it follows that NIST cybersecurity framework across the top, right? So detecting uh, an event, analyzing it, containing any threats, eradicating them, removing them from the environment. More importantly though, recovering that environment and then making sure we understand what happened, what did we do, how can we learn from that? And, and more importantly, how do we make sure we're getting better, right? And that's that's a huge key there. But when we get into this incident response process, what it really does is allow our team to follow a set uh, predetermined efficient process that is customized depending on the inputs and the type of alert, right? So uh, one process may not fit every single type of security incident or event. Um, and so we can adapt accordingly to that. So as an analyst, I can come in, I see, you know, hey, we have a potentially unwanted program. Let's go through and understand what those logs look like. I don't have to navigate anywhere else. That log is right here for me. Um, I, I don't have to pop open a new window. Again, the idea of efficiency. More importantly, if I need help, I can also come into activities and, and we navigate together here. I can send an email. I can send a message directly to the rest of my team, individuals in particular. Again, facilitating collaboration. It's great to, you know, mean time to detection is, is really important. How soon can we detect a threat? But mean time to response is, in our book, a little bit more important, right? Great, we've seen something and we've said, said that we've saw something. How do we respond to that and how fast can we respond to that? And, and this platform, the processes, and obviously the people on the back end allow us to do that in a, a very effective manner. Last thing here, you know, as we you know go through this detection analysis phase, you know, things shift and change depending on the inputs that I put here, right? So if it's safe, obviously I don't need to go through the containment eradication. We've we've determined it's safe. We'll just skip to stage six, let you guys know, hey, like we've saw we saw this program, it's it's being used in the right manner, uh, came from the right place, we're we're good to go. Versus malicious, this is a good example of Maybe something slipped past the antivirus, right? Maybe the tool, you know, I don't want to say failed us, but, you know, just didn't pick up on maybe a more sophisticated attack or, you know, what was normal once it got into the environment and planted something else that led to uh, a nefarious actor. This allows us to say, okay, we've said it's malicious. 
instead of going through analysis, we're going straight to containment, right? So being able to kind of navigate in a more automated fashion um, allows us to react accordingly. The other thing I, I want to touch on is the ability to, particularly for those uh, companies who may not have a documented security process or incident response process, or you know, a lot of folks have it in a PDF and, and similar to their hardware management that Sean brought up earlier, you know, they look at it once a year, every every six months maybe. And so part of our service is being able to help you document those in a live environment. And so this is an example of a malware workflow. And this is just, you know, gives us an idea of what different tracks a protect, particular alert or event can take depending on what we're seeing, right? Again, safe, pretty straightforward. We, we're gonna close that out, you know, deliver a report versus, you know, hey, malicious, obviously a little bit more work needs to be done this allows us to take a more efficient process and path and, and really dictate to our security analysts what they need to not just do, but also the information they need to capture. It's a huge thing in, in cybersecurity is transparency. What are we doing? What are we seeing? And, and how can we deliver that information to you to make sure you're feeling comfortable we're staying on top of that, uh, that particular threat? Knowing that we have eight minutes, the other thing I'll I'll focus on is the dashboards, right? And this this kind of goes into that threat hunting. Hey, things may seem normal, um, but when we look under the hood, they're actually not. And so part of the dashboard functionality is the ability to obviously see the information in, in a pretty clear manner and, and you know understand what's going on from like the network, the performance and security side of the house. But what we're also looking for our anomalies, right? Obviously, we have anomaly detection engine that's triggering that for us, but some of these are, you know, from the network bandwidth perspective or maybe the performance perspective on a particular Windows server, we see a CPU spike, right? Hey, that's that's triggering some, some curiosity on our end of saying, hey, this is abnormal to the normal day-to-day -day of this particular a domain controller, right? What else is going on? And, and by utilizing the right technology and, and having those processes in place, we know the questions to ask, right? We need to, you know, hey, what IP address was connecting at this exact time? Was another user logged in? Were we just doing an update, right? It could be totally benign. We're going to investigate that and, and really uncover, you know, does normal really look normal, right? And I think Matt said it perfectly, you know, I tend to flip it the other way, but verify and trust, trust and but verify, right? Making sure like, okay, it looks normal. You know, normally we're going to trust this, but we're, we're definitely going to make sure that it is normal um, and investigate accordingly. And then, you know, if it isn't, you know, go into true incident response uh, mode. Yeah, Corey, I, I like uh, yours better, verify and trust. <laughs> yeah. I'm feeling it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think this yeah, I, I think this was really helpful. Um, I, I know we want to leave a little bit of runway for for questions, um, but I, I mean, is there any uh, you know last words before we just dive into a, another slide or two? Yeah, last thing um, from my end is you know again, I'll, I, I'm a huge proponent of the people process technology. You have to have all three, and like I said, in an integrated fashion. If you just have top notch top notch technology. Eventually, it's going to gather dust and become shelfware. If you, you just have process and technology, you tend to not get the adoption because people aren't trained on it, right? And I think that's really the value that you know we can bring to the table is is you know coming in that integrated fashion and and really going for efficiency and accuracy. And I think that's I'll leave it at that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Corey. Um, Charles, if you can kick chair privileges back to me. I'll just uh, show another slide or two, if you don't mind. All right. You guys see that, hopefully. Oh. Um, so, you know, real, real quick, um, and then we'll, uh, uh, you know, see if there's any, any questions here. Um, you know, we, we talked about extended detection and response. You saw it. Uh, some of you might say, well, what, what does that mean? What does that service look like? And just from a topology perspective, you've got your network on the left-hand side of the slide. Um, and then there's a few different components. I mean, think of it as a, a, a service bundle. So we've got a network traffic uh, analyzer. Um, you know, that, that would sit out of band at any points of uh, network egress, for example. Um, so that, that's 
certainly one one component. We've got you know a log agent that would be loaded onto um, you know servers and and workstations as, as an example that uh, collects logs and pushes it back to the uh, <laughs> the cloud collector and ultimately into the the security information event management platform. Um, you have uh, uh, EDR, so next gen antivirus and uh, endpoint detection and response that's loaded up on servers and workstations that um, does a lot of the you know the the blocking and tackling, but it's also used for threat hunting for forensics. And by the way, if you made an investment in tools already, um, we can run this uh, you know solution in simulation mode for an added layer. And then you've got you know, all the other applications, web applications, um, uh, you know, things like 365, ATP, uh, you know, your two-factor authentication, MDM. So we want to try to capture as much of this information and feed it back into the SIM, correlate that data, and be able to interpret it so that we have this 360-degree view. And then lastly, we want to perform routine vulnerability scanning. Um, to, to make sure that we understand if there's any gaps on a continuous basis. And, and then, you know, that all flows into, you know, leveraging the NIST cybersecurity framework and ultimately the folks that, like I said earlier, are interpreting data um, uh, and, and then uh, taking action. So that is what extended detection and response services look like um, at, um, at, at, at DioPath. And then, you know, what, one last point, um, you know, we talked about, you know, security is a journey. Uh, if you were to engage with us, if you haven't already, uh, you know, we want to make sure we're driving continuous improvement. And so, you know, generally we work with clients or at phase three, defense in depth, and, you know, going into detection response and containment and remediation um, generally takes, a, you know, a, a third party to assist. And we're here to help you with that. So I've got two minutes to spare. I kind of riffed through that uh, th those last two slides. Hopefully that made sense. Um, Charlie, any questions out there that we can answer? Uh, yes, we have one question, and it is: If there is, uh, sorry, uh, are you seeing companies use their cybersecurity culture and possible? And posture as a competitive advantage. If so, how are they being leveraged? Ooh, that's a great question, um, Sean. I'll, I'll let you go first, but I, I have yeah. some um, thoughts on that. Yeah, I think uh, one of the the greatest changes in consciousness that I have seen over the last year is people are getting hit left and right uh, for evidence that they are doing the right thing from a security standpoint. It is. Uh, every single one of my clients have been asking about it. Like, why are you doing this? Why are we here? Why are we doing an assessment? Well, our business partners want to know that we're secure. So that to me, that's the fundamental one I'm seeing across the board. Over to you, Matt. It, yeah, and I, I think just a quick point because we're, we're almost the time. Um, I, I think organizations are, are realizing that, you know, even outside of compliance and regulation, um, if you're doing the right thing on the security front, it, it can be used as a competitive advantage if, if uh, you know, you're you're part of a supply chain where you're working with, I'll just, you know, Walgreens or Walmart, um, and, and and there's there's one organization that has things pretty well stitched up and evidence that they have that. To Sean's point, versus another that that, that doesn't, and, and and all other things are equal. You know, who, who do you think secures the contract in that scenario? And so. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of that, but, you know, we're, we're going to see a lot more compliance and regulation coming down the pike too to um, expedite uh, investments in cybersecurity. So we're, we're at time. Um, Charlie, uh, back over to you, but thank you to everyone for uh, investing their time and in, in, uh, talking about cybersecurity. Appreciate it. Charlie, any closing comments? All right, we may have lost uh, Charlie. So thanks again for everyone's I'm time. Here. I'm here, I was on mute, oh. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you for uh, joining our webinar today. A recording will be sent out and also listed on our YouTube channel. 
If you'd like to attend any of our additional roundtables or webinars, they are all listed on our events page on diapath.com. Thank you everyone and have a good day.